It's Monday, April 22. In the headlines, 20 youngsters highlighted at the Prime Minister's National Youth Awards for Excellence. In business news, applications open for Christmas in July trade show. Regionally, Barbados suggests applicable and achievable solutions needed to reach SDGs. In sports, we have results from the Diamond League in China that happened over the weekend. This is the news on PBC Jamaica. I'm Simone Absalom Gale. Prime Minister Andrew Holness spoke of actions being taken to foster the development of the nation's youth as he celebrated the gains that Jamaica has made in youth development at the 2023 Prime Minister's National Youth Awards for Excellence on the weekend. Just about 20 people were presented awards for achievements in various fields. The Prime Minister says his government has made it a priority to advance Jamaica's youth. I'm happy to share that in this year's budget, my administration has set aside $200 million to help 1,000 students across the island who need extra support with tuition fees. He noted the removal of the requirement of guarantors when applying for a loan through the Students' Loan Bureau and the investment in schools focused on science, technology, engineering and mathematics. We are also expanding the NHT scholarship program to boost the labor supply for the construction sector to support students studying subjects such as civil engineering, construction management, and architecture. 10 students per year will receive up to $1 million each towards their tuition in this area. He noted the removal of fees from registration for training at the Hart NSTA Trust. We have gone further. This year, the Heart Trust will introduce the Community Action Rewarding Engagement Initiative, which will provide selected heart trainees with a monthly transport grant of $15,000 and an additional stipend of $13,000 per week to encourage more of our young people, especially those who are in communities who say, I want to get training, but I can't afford the bus fare, or I want to get training, but I can't afford the lunch. We are making it easier for you. You now have no excuse to get out there and get a skill and get certified. The youngsters awarded on the weekend were highlighted for their work in various areas, such as sports, agriculture, youth development practitioner, youth serving organization, arts and culture academics, leadership, journalism, social media influencer, entrepreneurship, nation building, international achievement, innovation in science and technology, and environmental protection. I'm always happy to share spaces with young people who are enthusiastic and passionate, ambitious and industrious, and uh, intelligent and innovative. The Department of Correctional Services, DCS, has received 12 new motor vehicles valued at $97.5 million. The new vehicles include four Nissan Frontier pickup trucks, four Nissan panel vans, two futon buses, one Hyundai SUV, and one futon flatbed truck bringing the total number of vehicles in the DCS's fleet to 119. Speaking at the commissioning ceremony held on April 19 at the Torres Street Adult Correctional Center in Kingston, State Minister in the Ministry of National Security, Juliet Cuthbert Flynn, said the event signals the government's commitment to improve the operational capacity of the DCS. She hinted at plans to strengthen the operational structure, infrastructure, human resource capacity and use of technology within the DCS. She says a focus will also be placed on improving the rehabilitation and reintegration process of offenders. In the past decade, the total trade volume between Jamaica and the Dominican Republic has surged by 161%.
Anticipation for further growth remains high, a sentiment echoed during the second edition of the Dominican Republic Jamaica Business Forum held at the AC Hotel by Marriott Kingston on Thursday. Then Nina Rodney tells us more. I was really, really surprised, but it's a good way to forge this connection and promote trade with Jamaican businesses eager to collaborate and most important, to do business. Yes, it is truly astonishing to see how this event has outdone the previous one, raising the bar even higher for excellence and success. That was the Dominican Republic's ambassador to Jamaica, Her Excellency Angie Martinez, as she joyfully expressed her sentiments during the second edition of the Business Forum where numerous small businesses from the Dominican Republic showcased their products. In her address, the ambassador highlighted the substantial growth between the two nations, underscoring the anticipation for further expansion. As you know, our trade has impressively grown, now exceeding more than $134 million. And we started with $34 million. Yes. Thank you. Additionally, Jamaican exports to the Dominican Republic are expected to increase tenfold, indicating a substantial rise in trade activities. Yes, another round of applause. Speaking on trade, Senator Kamina Johnson-Smith, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, notes that the bulk of the total trade between the two nations has primarily been propelled by exports from the Dominican Republic to Jamaica. The DR is already one of Jamaica's top 20 trading partners, and over the last 10 years, total trade with the Dominican Republic has increased by 161%, driven largely by exports from the DR to Jamaica, but also, of course, the vibrancy of Ambassador Martinez, as we've heard about from every speaker and will continue to hear about through the day. But we are, as Jamaicans, also determined to continue to increase our exports, which as you have heard, are trending in the right directions to the DR. The Senator also urged private sector members to leverage the CARICOM Dominican Republic Free Trade Agreement established in 1998 to capitalize on the preferential access it offers to all CARICOM countries, including Jamaica. I also want to encourage members of the private sector to use the CARICOM DR free trade agreement signed all the way back in 1998 in order to benefit from the preferential access provided under that agreement to all CARICOM countries, including Jamaica. Uh, we have been working with the Trade Board to actively simplify how they provide and share information. So I want to encourage you to reach out to them, to arm yourself with the information about how to identify opportunities and move forward on this great path filled with potential. Reporting for the news on PBCJ, I'm Denita Rodney. Improved psychoanalysis and training for workers are two of several changes coming to the Overseas Employment Program, which is better known as the Farm Work Program. Minister of Labor and Social Security Colonel Charles Jr. gave us an update in his last statement to Parliament. I rise to update this Honorable House briefly on matters relating to the Overseas Employment Program, better known as the Farmer Program, as per our commitment to highlight also a few of the plans going forward. During my ministerial visits to both Canada and the US last year, we spent a lot of time listening to employers and our farm workers and other stakeholders, um, and they highlighted a number of challenges uh, which we are making every effort to address. When we discussed this last year, we gave a commitment to improve the selection process and to better prepare our Jamaican workers, our candidates, to perform well when they go overseas. We will therefore be introducing a range of strategies to do so in order to boost the program. These include Building the capacity and employability uh, skills of workers through human resource development and training, improving service delivery to both workers and employers through the ministry and through our liaison service, and strengthening 
of the capacity of the program to satisfy the needs of our workers as well as our employers, both of whom are critical to us uh, in this partnership. As a part of the regular process, candidates who we nominate are called upon to ensure that they are literate and numerate, that everyone can understand why. Time now for the business report with Denise Williams. Good day, everyone, and thank you for joining us on the business report. I'm Denise Williams, your guide to the latest happenings in the world of business. The Tourism Enhancement Fund, TEF, is now accepting applications for this year's staging of its Christmas in July trade show. Interested companies and individuals are being asked to complete an expression of interest form via the TEF website and submit all required information by May 10 at 5 p.m. The event provides an opportunity for local producers of gifts and souvenir items to promote their products to alternative market segments. Products may range from categories of desktop solutions, spa and aromatherapy, decor, clothing, fine art, jewelry, souvenirs, food, and products created from organic and natural fibers. Since 2014, the Christmas in July trade show has showcased more than 1,000 local manufacturers and artisans who have earned approximately $150 million from the tourism industry and corporate Jamaica. Consumers paid an average of 3.7% more for apparel between March 2023 and March 2024, the RJR Newsroom reports. These price movements were influenced by supply chain movements and overall increases in manufacturing prices. The Statistical Institute of Jamaica, STATI, says for the month of March alone, prices of items in the group clothing and footwear moved upwards by 0.2%. The cost of clothing and footwear each increased by an average of 0.2%. One-on-one -on -one educational services, the e-learning solutions provider, saw a 27% fall in revenues to $111.37 million compared to $153.45 million in the corresponding period last year. Operating loss for the six months amounted to $31.99 million relative to the operating profit of $22.13 million reported in 2023. Operating loss for the February quarter amounted to $15.29 million compared to 2023 when operating profit was $8.27 million. During trading on April 19, 2024, the top three advancing stocks covered the finance and transportation sectors on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. MFS Capital Partners Limited shares advanced by 20.83% for a 30 cent price increase to close at $1.74 with 14,143 shares traded. First Rock Capital Holdings Limited US dollar shares advanced by 12.9% for a one cent price increase to close at US 5 cents with 14 shares traded. Nutsford Express Limited shares advanced by 10.88% for a $1.12 price increase to close at $11.41 with 324 shares traded. On the declining stocks that traders experienced on April 19, 2024, the top three losers covered the food, finance and transport sectors. Everything Fresh Limited declined by 10.34% for an 18 cent drop to close at $1.56 with 1,016 shares traded. JMMB Group Limited 9.5% shares declined by 9.93% for a 14 cent drop to close at $1.27 with 810,423 shares traded. Trans Jamaican Highway Limited US dollar shares declined by 
7.37% to close at 2 US cents with 726,047 shares traded. Over on the Twin Island Republic of Trinidad and Tobago Stock Exchange trading on April 19, 2024, registered a volume of 888,396 shares crossing the floor of the exchange valued at 7,274,534 Trinidad and Tobago dollars and 60 cents. Massey Holdings Limited was the volume leader with 782,440 shares changing hands for a value of 3,421,549 Trinidad and Tobago dollars and 82 cents, followed by Augustini's Limited with a volume of 36,363,000 shares being traded for 2,509,047 Trinidad and Tobago dollars. Moving from the money moves of investors, executives, and companies, we turn to the Forex market. On April 19, 2024, the Bank of Jamaica reported that US $61.5 million was bought from Forex traders, while US $57.1 million was sold to Forex traders. Buying directly from the Bank of Jamaica, foreign currency traders sold the US dollar for $156.35 and bought the US dollar for $155.20. The difference between the buy and sell rate was $1.10, which represents a profit for Forex traders for every US dollar traded. Canadian Forex traders earned a trading profit of $5.54 from transactions with the Bank of Jamaica. The Canadian dollar was sold at $114.40 and bought for $108.86. For traders looking at the British pound, they pocketed a profit of $8.39, selling it for $196.17 and buying it for $187.78. For our credit report tip of the day, your credit score acts as your financial resume when applying for a mortgage. A higher score can help you secure better interest rates and loan terms, potentially saving you thousands over the life of your loan. With a strong credit score, you're more likely to qualify for a larger loan amount, making it easier to purchase your dream home or invest in income properties. And with that, we wrap up today's business report. I'm Denise Williams, appreciate your company. Stay well informed, stay ahead of the curve. Until our next update, take care. In regional news, Barbados has been making some suggestions about how countries can attain the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. Chief Research Officer in the Office of the Prime Minister in Barbados, Chanel Richards, says countries must have applicable and achievable solutions. And Senior Operations Officer at the Caribbean Development Bank, Albert Ellis, says the Caribbean region is facing intense pressure in realizing its legitimate development aspirations. SIDS will always be small, and therefore we have to think beyond our geographical boundaries in order to be able to achieve the SDGs. So one of the priority areas which we need to have addressed is the access to the right quantity and quality of resources to finance the SDG gap. The global financing gap for LICs, LMICs, and the highly vulnerable middle-income countries is at least $1 trillion per year, and it could be up to $2 trillion per year. And so the Bridgetown Initiative was born out of the need to address these deficiencies and inequity in the global financial systems. The initiative has evolved, and as we prepare for its third iteration, 3.0, our acts go beyond climate financing. We need to be able to fund the entire SDG agenda, health, education, infrastructure, the entire agenda. The goals of poverty reduction and ultimate eradication, economic enfranchisement to end the scourge of intergenerational hardships in an environment that is more stable and secure seem particularly challenging. Recent data suggests that approximately one in five persons in the Caribbean still live in poverty. The impact of climate change, given the bank's Burma country's acute vulnerabilities, has been severe and in many instances expose and exacerbate 
a huge infrastructure gap in the region. In Guyana, to alleviate shortages in the healthcare sector, the government started the recruitment of Cuban nurses last year. On Friday, Health Minister Dr. Frank Anthony announced that 50 nurses have already arrived this year, with another 50 expected by the end of April. Late last year, you said that we would be expecting about 200 nurses from Cuba um, in the early part of this year. Can we get an update on that? So we had some nurses that came in from Cuba already. I think we had about 50 that came in. And later this month, we have another 50 that is coming in. Um, I think they're set for around the 24th of this month. So that's the update. And they'll be distributed to different hospitals across the country. <laughs> they're basically when they come in, we put them at different institutions. So they're not all located at one place. So I think we have some at Georgetown Hospital, we have some in New Amsterdam, some in Sadi, some in Linden, and similarly that the same pattern we'll follow with um, with this new batch that is coming. In. As the Grenada Football Association prepares to send its national teams to participate in various FIFA and CONCACAF competitions, the cost of regional air travel continues to pose a significant challenge for the association. With aspirations to compete at the highest levels, the GFA is calling for collective action from the CONCACAF region to address this pressing issue. GFA President Marlon Glean has emphasized the financial burden imposed by regional travel on the association. As the GFA strives to provide opportunities for its teams to compete on the international stage, the escalating cost of air travel within the region has become a major impediment. It's an ongoing conversation um, that we've been having with FIFA, that we've been having with CONCACAF, and we've been having as individual football associations. Um, you know, as of right now, everybody does their own thing, and as a result, um, sometimes you get unlucky and get a draw to play in Central America. Um, St. Lucia went to Central America recently. As a matter of fact, St. Lucia went to Cuba recently for the women's game and cost them over $100,000 to get to Cuba, which is in the Caribbean. Glean highlighted instances where the association has been forced to withdraw teams from competitions due to the prohibitive expenses involved. Um, you know, going to Honduras and, uh, and um, some of the Central American countries, uh, round trip ticket sometimes is over 100000 uh, we were forced to pull out of our girls on the 20 te team sometime last year because a round trip ticket to Nicaragua at the time was 120,000 US dollars. Um, we were supposed to play in Jamaica, our girls on the 17 last year, and there were no routes to Jamaica, no commercial routes to Jamaica except through charter, and we were getting chartered flights at $70,000 to get to Jamaica. Recognizing that this is not solely a Grenadian issue, Glean urged solidarity and cooperation among regional stakeholders to explore avenues for mitigating the challenges faced by football associations across the Caribbean. And if we pool our resources together, we can charter an airline that can pick up two or three at a time and drop in various parts. Um, I think that might be the easiest way because so far FIFA and CONCACAF haven't been able to come up with a remedy for the cost of travel. Uh, so in that case, while we wait, I believe all these Caribbean football associations need to come together and um, pool the resources together and, um, and reserve or, or lease or, or, or have an arrangement with an airline company that would do all of our travels in the region um, at the same time, which would make it easier. Despite these challenges, the GFA remains committed to advancing football in Grenada and providing opportunities for its talented athletes to showcase their skills on a global platform. However, without sustainable solutions to address the issue of regional air travel costs, the association's aspirations for success may be hindered. Nisha Peters, GBN News. In sports, we go trackside with athletics. Several Jamaicans stood out at the opening Diamond League meet of the season in Jamin in China on the weekend. World indoor 60-meter bronze medalist Akeem Blake produced the season's best 10.20 seconds in the 100 meters race to finish behind the American pair of Christian Coleman and Fred Curley 
at 10.17 seconds in the men's 100 meters. Reigning national champion Rohan Watson was fourth in 10.27 seconds, while Johan Blake ran 10.43 seconds for the ninth place in the field of 10. The other Jamaican in the event, Megan Tapper, who was running her first 100-meter hurdles race of the season, finished eighth in 12.88 seconds. Two-time world champion Daniel Williams was fourth in the women's 100 meters hurdles in a season's best 12.56 seconds. Olympic champion Jasmine Comacho Quinn of Puerto Rico won the event in 12.45 seconds. In the men's 110 meters hurdles, Olympic champion Hansel Parchment in his first race of the season ended sixth in 13.33 seconds. Over now to cricket, uh, the West Indies women defeated Pakistan by two wickets to take an unassailable lead in their best of three one-day international series. Here are the details. Batting first, Pakistan puts on a solid performance with the bats as they look to even the series. Sidra Ali had an even 50, while Bisma Maruf top scored with a knock of 65 as they were bowled out for 223 runs. The West Indies bowlers put in an all round performance with Chanel Henry, the pick of the bowlers, with three wickets for 38 runs. Karishma Ramharak took three 48 runs and Afi Fletcher two for 46, doing the work for the visiting Caribbean team. In reply, the West Indies batters captain Haley. Matthews got the ball rolling with a knock of 44 at the top of the order. But it was her predecessor Stefani Taylor's player of the match, winning knock of 73, that included nine fours that set the tourists on their way to a series winning victory. Shamim Campbell also contributed with an innings of 52. But it was Zaida James and Karishma Ramharak that guided the visitors to victory, with Ramharak hitting the winning boundary to finish four not out. The West Indies ending on 225 for eight. Staying with cricket, in Guyana, there have been several instances of brothers representing their country and the national team at different stages, while some have even played together in the same 11. However, the instances of brothers opening the batting for their country are rare, as has been the case with in Burbies, this year's inter-county under-19 50-over competition. More in this report. The Ghana Cricket Board Inter-County on the 1950 over competition is ongoing, featuring the three counties, Burbies, Demerara and Essequibo, and the Guyana Cricket Board's Select 11. Now, one of the unique things about this year's competition is that Burbies, they have two brothers opening the batting, Rampatob Ramnot and Rampersod Ramnot. They have been uh, doing a pretty good job at the top of the order for Burbies, including steering their team, the defending champions, to a 10-wicket victory, both of them making half centuries against the Select 11 at the Metamerizar ground on the west coast of Demerara. I caught up with the two brothers earlier on Tuesday. You've been around Blue Cricket for quite a number of years now. Just reflect a bit how you started playing the game and what motivated you to get involved. Um, first of all, my father just take us to um to Portman Community Centre and we started playing a little softball game and then he, he see my potential and he said la, la, we go on playing hardball so we're gonna play the, the hardball we you know we keep training every day he keep, he keep telling me train 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 and then we decided to come a little better and then we start get into the game more serious and by the game goes on and on and on we, we get into play for boy we start to execute our talent and people start to see us and they say like you know the talent is here because he had to go and do what he The father used to play the game as well? Yeah, he used to play the game, but he was a local. Not really like no, like no big thing. He just, for you, you know the little thing you get in here, yeah, you just teach me. And we just teach him. And the thing just, you know, in a circle. So we're just teaching our, one another all the time. Our uh, first start playing was a little afraid of the hard work. But after that, I keep training, training. Start getting more in the game. And I keep pushing myself. Right. Um, any, any specific player that you look up to that you, as a role model? Yeah, Barbara Azam, because I love to see but mm -hmm. And even watching him from the phone, I go back to the practice, watch him, play copy one to his shots. Right, you're playing now for Barbara in the United States. Uh, any specific goals you set yourself in the long term that you want to achieve? I don't know, represent the national team this year. Let's go there and work, work hard. And that's it for the news on PBCJ. You can follow us on our social media platforms at PBC Jamaica. Thank you so much for watching.